This is the third event um, in our series of uh, rhetorical bodies this semester. Um, and we want to thank the Student Activities Brains Initiative for allowing us to do awesome stuff like this. Um, and we also should be really thankful to the Professor John Um He's so, a professor in French studies at uh, Louisiana State University. And uh, the author of many books. <laughs> Uh, he's the person who I was probably the most excited to hear able to get from the talk to us. Um, he, uh, I, I, I came across his website in like 2009, maybe, um, and that's the way that I sort of started seeing his work. Um, and since then, I've been paying as much attention as I can. Um, he, in 1994, wrote a book called Time Next Year, Gordy, Aristotle, Heidegger, Carried Out. And in 2004, um, with uh, Mark Monta, wrote uh, Blues and Jew Philosophy, which has like 120 page glossary of uh, terms, which is amazing, and a really cool case study at the end of it um, about the Alonso department. And then uh, 2001, uh, right, a book called Political Physics, Deleuze Dare on the Body Politics. And that question of body politic comes back up in political affect, um, connecting the social and the somatic, which came out in 2009. Um, and just to really briefly touch on some energy from that book, um, Professor W. Uh, sort of writes in summarizing like, what he's done with that book uh, that while much recent philosophy has taken an interest in the emotion, that interest has been with an individualist group. And what his own work does is to address the need to think of humans as collective and emotional, as well as individual and rational. Um, to give you a sense of the huge variety of materials he's drawn from here, um, I just wanted to like pull a little bit from the first part of that book, um, where he's talking about the sort of streams coming into the project, um, so that he gives a sense of the ambition involved. Um, so he draws on work from John's work from the notion of emergence that's drawn from philosophical reflection on complexity theory, the ontology of losing water, the concept of autonomous systems proposed by the Chilean biologists and philosophers Humberto Maturana and Francisco Varela, the eco-social take on biology on his developmental systems theory, a hybrid theory of emotion drawn from a variety of psychological and neurobiological approaches with a particular focus on proto-empathic identification or the emotional contagion, the 4EA cognition school of philosophical work and cognitive and the way that all of those come together in the case studies that are the last uh, sort of part of the book is just terrifically fun to watch. Um, and <coughs> throughout the book, um, as Professor Tertebi analyzes the way that, um, to use his language, politically shaped and triggered affective cognition is the sense making of body politic, um, it's just great fun. Um, so we're lucky to have him here today. Um, and will be discussing. Um, well, then we have on flyers like the name, but um, it's Deleuze, close enough. Deleuze Music and Nation Worker. Thank you. Well, I, I want to thank you and the, the people who asked me to come with the uh, uh, Literary Theory Reading Group and uh, Joe, especially, and Andrew, who are the contact people. So thank you very much. Uh, I had fun at lunch, too. Uh, and I'm slightly less caffeinated now than I was at home, so but we'll see how that goes. Um, this is kind of also a case study. Uh, I would need a little bit of team. The case studies I did in political affect were the result of me being obsessed by particular events, like Terry Shiava. And I had to read everything in for, for like uh, six weeks or something. And, uh, you know, uh, law and medicine and whatever. And then uh, six months later, Katrina hit. Of course, that was, you know, I was obsessed for 12 weeks, I think, that I was reading meteorology and whatever, uh, history and all sorts of stuff. So uh, this is another one of these uh, uh, um, things. And it, it's, it stems from a particular passage in Deleuze and Guattari's uh, Antiochus. So it's particularly fun for me to be here, actually, because the political affect is with the University of Minnesota Press. 
And the English translation of the Wizard of the Torahs, both the uh, Antiochus and Thousand Plateaus were with uh, UMP Press. And I think Doug uh, Armada said, well, the reason we were able to do your book for a time is because of the royalties from <laughs> Thousand Plateaus. <laughs> so I said, that's good. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, all right, so let's uh, go and then if you see the uh, hyphens I've got up there, I always love these hyphenated things. I could have a neuro in there, I could have a techno in there, but uh, this is good enough for, for now. Okay, so I'll talk briefly about the Liz's ontology and why we're all hurricanes. And then I'll talk about this ontology, biology, and history of affect. Um, talk about the difference in affect and emotion, what these development systems theory people do is enable us to talk about human biology as including the social. So it's not, so we are biosocial, and that's what these guys say, and they're philosophers, they're, well, some of them are, but they're biologists. So, uh, so there's exciting movements in biology, I think it's time for the humanities to reclaim the positive notion of, uh, of biological science as away from the sort of genetic reductionist, uh, neo-Darwinist, evolutionary psychology stuff that we rightfully had to fight, but we fought that a lot of times with the, um, with the weapons of social constructivism. And uh, these are all horrible cliches, but I, I think there's a way that we, that we do ourselves a disservice by ceding the biological to the scientists, right? There's lots of different biological science now, uh, some of which includes the social. So we'll talk a, lot, a bit about that. We can talk a long time about that. But on my website, I, I teach a course also. I have research papers and I have my course, paper, course pages. And I'm teaching a course on evolution and biology and morality. And so maybe we'll read some. Maybe we'll talk, mention some of the people I've known in that class. And then in history, we'll talk about this difference between cultural evolution or bio, well, biocultural evolution or political physiology or whatever. Um, as opposed to the notions about memes uh, or genes. Right? I don't think that either of those is, is the target of, of, of cultural, biocultural evolution. So I'm going to distinguish genes from memes. They're both seen as packets of information, and I don't think that's where we're at. And we're on the side uh, mention of this uh, anthropology of the literary school. It's really interesting. It's like a lot of debates within anthropology about how far back the warfare goes. Activity, not violence. There's always been lots of people killing each other. But whether how we define war and what its relation is to chimpanzee, inter and intra group violence, all sorts of really important stuff. And then we'll talk about music. Uh, there's been some new uh, interesting uh, sort of uh, eco, nevo, nevo music. Uh, and uh, in particular, this uh, distinction between the berserker rage triggered by war dance and song. And the, the cultural echo of that is the haka. You've ever seen the haka performed by the, uh, the All Blacks. Uh, and all, lots of South Sea Island ones. I saw a great YouTube where the New Zealanders did their haka. And then the Fijians did their haka before I uh, uh, woke up uh, rugby match. It was, it was great. And that's kind of a Dangerous, uh, the danger would be to generate some sort of folklore, exoticism, and all the things. Like anyway, uh, on the other hand, you need to get yourself jazzed up to play rugby. And uh, it's really, we could do a whole thing on, on the role of the, of the, of the, of the, the haka versus the phalanx. Because non haka doing rugby teams tend to link arms and stare down the, uh, the all blacks. You've ever seen that. Uh, it's an amazing sight. Um, so anyway, the other side, one of the other ways in which uh, music and war and geo bio neuro techno stuff goes together is the phalanx, right? It's marching, uh, military units marching together. And they often have like a drum beat. But there are only certain geo uh, techno uh, opportunities that are, available, uh, are able to be is one able to arm, what, what am I trying to say? Can, the phalanx can only be used in certain geo techno things because if you've got an open field and machine guns, you can't march in the phalanx. So, 
However, uh, marching is still maintained in modern military uh, training, uh, even though it's not used in the battlefield. Uh, that's a really bad thing, like it's in the battlefields for 300 years or whatever. Uh, but um, we still have that in, in, uh, in training. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay. So I say we're all hurricanes. Um, and uh, the idea here is that various groupings of events have the same structure. But that there we have those, those are structures of what, what it was called dynamic processes. And uh, they result in actual products. So I'm going to come back to this slide, but for now I'm going to use this idea of a diagram you know, for Foucault's terms, the diagram is opticism for disciplinary things. This is the diagram for hurricanes. Right? All hurricanes, more or less, have the same uh, virtual idea of the structure. So this structure doesn't exist. And it's hard to, we would have to get into all sorts of technical ontology questions here, but they, they don't de exist. This, this, you don't ever see this. What you might see is comparing different hurricanes, right? insisting, he says, rather than existing, you see the same structure. And this is a whole dynamic thing that we talk about at different times is sort of an unfolding of what a hurricane is. They develop you know, low pressure cells, thunderstorm cells, this, that, and the other thing. Um, but each one is individuated, right? E each one, uh, each hurricane is itself a singular individuation of this structure. And this is Katrina. Um, so that, the basic idea of that is you have this uh, 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 a couple of Deleuzean slogans. It says the whole world is an egg. What does he mean by that? It means there are material systems right, that have not yet been individuated, but they may maintain uh, 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 processes right, that at certain thresholds will click in to have, a, uh, uh, to have an individuation. So it's a pre-individual field. Right, which calls the egg, and then there's the individuation process. The pre-individual field for a hurricane is, are the water and temper, temperature currents off the coast of Africa, uh, which at certain thresholds will click in and form these uh, funnels and blah, blah, blah. Uh, so that's the thing, differential field at the certain thresholds of the relations between these dynamic processes will produce an individuation. But there's no, off the coast of Africa, there are no little hurricanes waiting to be born. Right? There's an undifferentiated, well, not a, no, undifferentiated, pre-individual field from which an individuation process happens. And it's heterogeneous. He uses another example from the French thinker Gilbert Simondon of crystallization. So it's, it's a little simpler example because it's just a mostly homogeneous field uh, with a little uh, grain to it. But th this is a little more interesting. But the, the question then is, if this is the model for all events, then human beings, we are all hurricanes. Right? Except that our egg right, is much more complicated, much more heterogeneous, and as we're going to see, includes uh, extrasomatic or social relations as well. So that the field that we're putting together, or that we're resolving, uh, as we form our own hurricanes, which last for 70 or 80 years, rather than for four or five days, well, a couple of weeks, I guess, um, is going to be uh, including both the DNA, the material of the egg, the rest of the uh, mother's body, and the social system within which the, the, the child is raised. So one of the more interesting books I'm reading lately is by an anthropologist named Sarah Hurdy, H-R-D-Y. Uh, it's a book called Mothers and Others, and her thesis uh, about the growth of evolutionary growth of human empathic and uh, mind reading capacities is that it's a uh, result of cooperative breeding. Uh, that is, that humans uh, landed their infants to other uh, people much more than chimps do. Chimpanzee mothers never let go of them. And it's good because otherwise the uh, other males around would kill it. So there's infanticide, but uh, whereas uh, I always joke, you have a kid, just try, just try to keep it away from <laughs> from other people. You have to. There's like a ritual. You hand, and he comes into a room, and it gets passed around. Um, and she has a whole bunch of stuff. 
Uh, it's great stuff. It's the sort of anthropological reading of it takes a, it takes a village. Uh, OK, anyway. So that's, uh, that, that, that's us. Uh, we're on hurricanes. Uh, everything's a hurricane. This table is a hurricane. It's kind of slow, coagulated. Not really doing much, but <laughs> it's a, uh, it's a, uh, we might as well treat it as an actual product, an actual substance, right, for practical reasons. <coughs> but actually, it's a really, just a really slow moving hurricane. It happens to have coagulated. Okay, now we've got some of our, I got a few more uh, hyphens in there, but I probably should have uh, neuro in there somewhere, and cognitive. So this is a quote from uh, uh -oh. oh, I guess that's okay. Yeah, no, no. So here he wants to include the affective. We'll talk a little bit about that into the social and technical. And uh, he has this stuff about desire. So this reading of Deleuze is to see that he's uh, a romantic, or naturalist, or something. Everything is. Machine, there's no desire outside of a particular uh, field of uh, what I would call subjectivation practices, subjectification practices. Um, okay, so then at the end, he talks a little bit about the relation between desire and the war machine, which is fancy, scary, epithet of bourgeois notion, uh, just means a, a horizontal social uh, assembly. It has relations to war and battle, but it's not the essence of the war machine is not the war. In the sense. Okay. The, uh, then the interesting thing there is that the passions or effectuations of desire that differ according to the assemblage. So that's what we're going to talk about: differences between uh, Haka assemblage and the Okay. Um, so in particular. Right. He uses this guy, uh, Tetien, a French uh, historian of uh, warfare, and shows that the phalanx, which is a sort of you know, middle class revolt, as it were, uh, forms the so-called hoplite revolution. And it's the, move, it's the move from an aristocratic society via the tyrants. Right? So the tyrants are actually make alliances with the people in order to break the hold and power of his fellow aristocrats. Uh, but then they are uh, then overthrown later by a, a more fully democratic uh, revolution. But there's a, there's a desiring difference that he says, between, the, uh, between these different uh, military assemblages. So he says it's a case of the man dismounting from the horse. The horse were the aristocrats. Horseback, and then the animal human relationship being replaced by the relationship between men in the military, so the infantry. And he says that paves the way for the advent of peasant soldier. Peasant is not really right, it's middle class farmers, uh, the citizen soldier. You see that closer, we're going to have one last twist at the end with the rowers of the Trimenes in, uh, in uh, Athens. So one of the big turning points that Plato talks about, uh, Plato being a sort of landed gentry guy, is the, uh, how much better the Battle of Marathon is than the Battle of Salamis. Salamis is the city folk. They didn't have horses, they didn't, or they didn't have land, right? They were like artisans. Or whatever, right? So Plato is a real kind of, uh, uh, if you remember, who was the uh, uh, Foghorn Leghorn kind of guy? And so I said, you have to have land. <laughs> uh, he, you know, he doesn't trust anybody who doesn't have land. He just has like a shop. So, uh, so that last uh, move from the aristocrats dethroned by the guys who march and marathon, and then who resist the empire, blah, blah, blah. And then Salamis, the rowers, guys without land. What that meant for the move, what in different maneuvers within democracy. OK. All right, so Deleuze has this notion of affect, uh, which he gets from Spinoza. And uh, this uh, slogan is, we don't know what a body can do. 
I'm stuck on the little term body politic in there. And um, that's the sort of notion that in an encounter, the um, uh, composition of the individual bodies are going to be uh, changed. Right? And the corporate body or composite body that you form is going to uh, sort of rebound back or echo back on the individual bodies. And that's going to be felt as joy or sadness. When the, when the encounter uh, meshes with your rhythms, right? Uh, if it does, and form a, a, a better, a more powerful assemblage, then that's felt as joy. If not, it's felt as sex. Uh, there's complicated, we've been talking a lot earlier today, there's very complicated things. Aha, but what about the Nazis in Nuremberg? They were out of their minds with joy, they had a much more powerful composite body. So yes, there's no guarantee that joy is, uh, is going to be the marker of progressive politics. But, so it should be felt. Another sort of sense, though, is that entering into this uh, emergent body or uh, composite body, the Greek, uh, the Greek, the French term there is agencement, and there's a notion that agency is hidden in there which we don't get in uh, assemblage. Uh, and so the uh, difference there we see between the rider, the horse, the stirrup, and the bow, the chariot driver, the chariot, the driver, the thrower, and the spear, the uh, linked phalanx with their spears and their shields, and the drummer, because there's always a drummer, right? There are these different uh, assemblages, and now we do stuff about this sort of sideboard effect with the guys with, you know, real-time uh, uplinks and network central board for those sorts of ways in which that could be sketched out too. So uh, that's what we're talking about there. I think we call the passions or effectuations of desire that differ according to the assemblage. And that leads us in to this notion of affect as a non-subjective emotion. So the notion that uh, affect is sort of in the air, and it's in the mood of a room, the mood of a party, the mood of an occupied site, uh, is the individual moods are sort of crystallizations of that uh, uh, floating mood. It would be very delicate to take that into relationship with what the sort of science, science psychology of mood and group mood and stuff like that. So, uh, I'm not in complete command of that subject, but uh, I think there's something we can do about it. But anyway, it's that notion of what takes you over the world and what you exist. And uh, there's that line there about active discharge versus uh, emotion. And then the, if you remember the distinction, it makes a distinction between joys sheer joy of the encounter uh, with a pleasure. It's a sort of subjective appropriation of the sheer joy of the encounter. That's what that in the courtly mode in the passages in the thousand uh, So that's, uh, there's lots of fun stuff there. So I'm going to lay out a bunch of stuff that we can come back to in questions. All right. So the particular emotion I want to focus on is rage. You know, the, the, Affective neuroscience people talk about five or six basic emotions right, that we share with mammals uh, further, down, further down the line and that we uh, can be seen behaviorally in uh, similar behaviors, can be seen uh, on the visage, on the face, right? Uh, so Darwin had done this stuff by comparing emotions in humans and animals. And, um, they claim you know, there are sort of dedicated triggers, so if you open up a you know, sort of, uh, animal torture uh, thing that they do, you open up a monkey's head and you hit a particular part in their brain, they'll be happy. And in another part, they'll be sad. So there's sort of dedicated neural pathways. So usually there's rage, uh, there's sadness, there is uh, fear, there is uh, joy, and one might just disgust. At least five, six. Then there was the, all sorts of theories about whether you can add them. Adding them together gives you more complicated ones, or whether it's not just individual ones. But the thing about rage is fun, I think, is that it's desubjectified. At the height of it, you're blacked out. So another great book from the University of Minnesota Press is by uh, Klaus Tableit, a male fantasy. And had a lot of effect on. 
sort of cultural studies, film, film studies. Uh, so the RoboCop and uh, Terminator stuff was tied back to some of the stuff that he did. Um, uh, and uh, the, the fun thing about rage is that it's a prey reaction, not a prey reaction. So if you have dogs or cats, you can trigger their rage by locking them in eye contact, getting, eye, getting higher than them, and sort of backing them into a corner, and then, then they can get mad. But when the cat is playing with a mouse, when it's leaping at you from behind the chair and you know, they attack your ankle, they're not bad. They're happy. It's blood. It's like overflowing. How could it be better than to, like, when kittens wrestle, right? <laughs> yeah. So if you want to see joy, watch kittens wrestle. But they're not mad at all. Um, okay. Uh, then, there's, like I said, there's these debates within philosophy of emotion about whether uh, you know, it's universal. Um, emotions or whether they aren't specific to different thresholds. And I try to, to different cultures. So I try to split the difference. I think for, for basic emotions, I think we have pretty similar uh, uh, inherited, evolved patterns. Uh, um, but the, what triggers that and how they're played out, I think we can talk about that in terms of social construction or this bio, biosocial. And there's nothing fancy about that. This is just how you treat your kids and how you teach them how it's appropriate to be mad or what to be mad about. Uh, so a kind of globalization joke about that. So I used to tell the story about, uh, well, you know, if you burn an American flag in certain neighborhoods, people will be mad. But, you know, when you're in town square or a Chinese city and burn an American flag, when you no big deal. And then this guy, Jeff Neal, and his good friend of mine said, of course it would be. They'd be mad. It's their handiwork. What do you think people, what do you think American <laughs> flags are made? <laughs> but you see the example, right? Uh, what you get mad about, or what you find disgusting, obviously with food is a clear example, right? There's no pre-ordained genetic inheritance that you'll be disgusted or in love with crawfish. Right? That's it. But you, when, if you are disgusted at that, it's a physical reaction. Some sort of you need a biosocial way to talk about that. There's a lot of things. All right, anyway, so this berserker rage. One of the things that uh, we found it's not that easy to kill people in cold blood. Right? Close range, cold blooded killing does not really happen that often. And that's a pretty robust uh, mammalian intra species effect. So, you know, uh, 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 territorial fights among uh, males to be the alpha or whatever, rarely go to the death. There's usually some sort of submission uh, signal and the, uh, the loser slinks away. Right? It can happen that people, that people that the animals die from their wounds or something, but it's usually not a to the death. There are some exceptions. You get lion alphas will kill the uh, cubs of the defeated lion, of the defeated alpha, but rarely will the two alphas go to uh, uh, you get uh, lone wolf uh, attacks, I hear, if lone wolf comes to take over a, a pack, sometimes that's, that goes to the end because the lone wolf's going to die anyway, so it's all fighting. Keep fighting. Uh, and then you do get chimpanzee uh, uh, skirmishes, border skirmishes, usually, but usually five or six chimps will gang up and strike them. So it's not war. It's like, like my tribe is going to attack your tribe or band or whatever. They don't do that. And it's not like one-on-one -on -one Achilles versus Hector, either. <laughs> so, uh, so one of the ways that humans have found how to, to get into this killing thing is to trigger this prey reaction, to trigger a berserker rage, right? But use it in an aggressive way. So here the Vikings did this uh, berserker thing, and then this is something I think this uh, van when they was going up. <laughs> Side of the van, <laughs> you see these kind of things. There'd be a whole psychosocial, sexual, cultural studies thing to do about, you know, these boy comic books. Uh, so, yes, here, here's my, my thesis is that one of my things is that the biologists themselves are moving away from this kind of strict mid century thing, which is that first line there that uh, the three uh, factors for natural selection, 
variation heredity and selection, right? Meaning variation of fitness affecting traits, which are her her heritable and are uh, subject to some sort of selection pressure, so that you get differential reproduction. Well, for a long time, the idea was that the only source of variation was uh, mutations and drift and sexual recombination. Uh, DNA was the only hereditary material, and uh, selection pressures came from the outside and from the environment. But these guys, uh, this is a 2010 book from MIT, so, so they're, not, they're not cranks and outsiders. This is not global warming denoters. Uh, there's a, a number of different so the two, the variation from phenotypic plasticity, we're not going to be able to talk too much about that, but that's a wonderful uh, biologist named Mary Jane West Everhart. It's a book called Developmental Plasticity and Evolution. Uh, and that's, that's really fun stuff. So some of my papers try to make the Lizzie sense out of that. But the epigenetic stuff just means everything outside of the DNA sequence, including at the very closest level what's called methylation, so methyl groups of the sort of chemical on the uh, DNA line. And they're folded up with histones and there's a whole bunch, right? Because DNA is not a string. Well, it's a string, but it's wrapped up and folded up. So the uh, sort of coding, if that's uh, taken off, it increases the ability for gene expression. So this notion of moving outside of the, to see what can be inherited beyond just the string of nucleotides uh, is the study of epigenetics. And that's been accepted up through uh, the level of the nucleus. And often to the level of the cell, different cell conditions in uh, uh, developing in, in uh, embryology, in, in, uh, embryonic development. Uh, we have to resolve, we have to be able to discuss uh, cell differentiation. All of our cells, hair cells and skin cells and brain cells liver cells and all the different types of cells all have the same DNA. So, like the old joke about the thermos. How does it know to keep it cold or to keep it hot? <laughs> How does the cell know to turn into a liver cell? Well, that's the study of the sort of relationship between the cascading uh, cells in the spatial, uh, spatial orientation and the gene expression pattern. <coughs> so lots of, uh, lots of fun stuff. So the developmental systems theory then looks at the, what they call the life cycle uh, as the unit of evolution and development. So they want to do evo devo stuff, but not just the uh, homeo, homeobox uh, triggers outside the uh, uh, genome, outside the cell, and even outside the body. So uh, a variety of uh, infant development stuff, uh, really interesting for me, one of the great stuff getting into this is that as a philosopher I can now talk about infant development and I realized that one of the things missing in the history of philosophy mostly due to the fact that uh, philosophers didn't do any child care <laughs> is that mostly when they talk about adult males yeah Plato did talk about child care actually, but other than that and Rousseau but it's kind of few and far between so anyway we're talking about uh, touches, the sort of the, the rhythm of intercorporeal touching uh, of mothers and infants. Mothers here obviously mean just primary caregiver, not necessarily the, the gestational birth mother, whoever becomes the primary caregiver. And all of the, what I heard he calls the allo mothers, everyone else who provides care. Could be fathers, could be older siblings, could be maternal grandmothers, extremely important in, uh, in tracking this stuff. Then we're talking about looks, the sort of child and infant's uh, thing, the sort of facial recognition, the way in which uh, children really, really early can imitate uh, facial expressions. Like 42 minutes in, or out, I guess. Uh, <laughs> they, have this, uh, they have this famous studies by these developmental psychologists that are making goofy faces, and the infant makes goofy faces. They have to be pretty simple faces. They're sticking your tongue in. It's pretty well established. Really well you can get that. Uh, and then finally, this sort of verbal interaction in terms of mother ease, this high pitched babbling. And uh, as Herdy said, you know, try it. Try to talk to an infant in a normal voice. You cannot do it. You will switch to. <laughs> and 
And you cannot resist making big googly eyes at them either. It happens. You just go look at a mom or a whoever taking an infant through the uh, through a uh, shopping mall. Everybody stops, and it's not a big deal. But it's not your kid. But you come up and go hey, to the kid, and it's perfectly acceptable. And in fact, if you don't, you know, you're, you're kind of weird. Why don't you like babies? So there's a whole, there's a lot of very interesting stuff. Okay. A little more technical stuff then. I said it's not genes or means. What I want to do is say that there has been cultural evolution for political physiology practices. So we said treating, teaching kids when and how to get mad, and what would be triggered and how mad you're able to get, etc., etc. Desensitizing them to uh, bloodshed and fighting, to hunting and fighting among the kids. Uh, those are sort of ways that warfare training works. It doesn't affect the genes. It affects the next generation's training of their kids. And to the extent that that becomes sort of locked into a cultural pattern, right? how do you teach a boy to become a man? How do you teach a girl to become a woman? The fact the way that the, the, the sort of granularity of the analysis that would enable you to identify that is what I mean by political physiology, the, the triggering of body politics. So give me an example, really well, uh, well, not, but a great example. In the Odyssey, when uh, Odysseus has disguised himself, come back as a beggar, right? and he's doing the first interview with Penelope, when he's still in disguise as a beggar. And his maid, the old maid Eurycleia, uh, who had uh, been, uh, raised him up, think, recognizes him. He grabs him by the neck and says, I'll break your neck if you say no word. And she says, okay. Now how did she recognize him? Exactly. It's a scar, isn't it? Yeah, or kind of scar? Come on. A wild boar hunt. So it's kind of his graduation from small game to big game and then to the battlefield. Probably when he's 18, he goes out with a spear and he hunts, hunts wild boar. Now that's some hunting there. Right? So he got tore up in his, on his thigh with a boar. Right? So you know, that's pretty much a fair front. Yeah, you and your spear and the wild boar with its tusks. <laughs> that's pretty good graduation. So I mean, to get you ready for that, that's a lot of fighting, a lot of hunting, a lot of killing. To get you ready for that before you step onto the battlefield. That's what I mean by political subject, uh, political physiology. Thing. How do you, Odysseus, get to the point where you can handle the stress of the battlefield? You don't just send kids out there, right? Start them on squirrels. And you start them with little wooden swords when they're fighting each other, right? And you build them all up. Uh, okay. All right, the history of war stuff, basically uh, the question is, does it start with the state and with agriculture, uh, or does it not? And the, the, the origin of war with the state idea is uh, upheld by a great, uh, and well, I think it's great because I agree with them. <laughs> A uh, guy at the University of Michigan, and I don't know at the home of the Gophers if I'm able to uh, acknowledge a Wolverine, but uh, that's a whole other thing about totems and where they still live on the sports teams. But uh, named Raymond C. Kelly, uh, he has a book about the uh, st uh, stateless societies in the origin of war. And he claims it begins with states. So there's a, there's a lot of uh, really interesting stuff. Okay. New evolutionary theory, new evil, evil music theory. So the idea is that we have humans are, according to these guys, the only really musical animals. A bird song is not music. It's music is being able to change rhythms in relationship to the changing rhythms of other partners. Whatever bird songs are, they are just sort of tricky. There are some learning, some but it's not really an exchange in the sense of it. And so Bissum is going to, I want to say, contrast some other explanations for the evolution of music abilities. It's neither sexual selection nor is it a schedule. Because what those things over, overlook, and he gives this sort of uh, what he thinks they've evolved from, they sort of put together from these various things. Basically, there's all sorts of timekeeping capacities 
in uh, the organic synthesis in chapter two of difference and repetition, uh, meaning uh, all sorts of timekeeping mechanisms on our biological level. Right? Circadian rhythms, the amount of sun, when it comes up, you can't sleep at night in, in the summer in, uh, in Minneapolis, right? Because it's light till 10.30 at night, for goodness sakes. <laughs> And then the sun comes up at four in the morning, how am I ever going to get to sleep? And then in a couple of months, not a couple of months, in about six weeks, it'll be dark at four o'clock in the afternoon, and am I ever going to be happy again in my life? Right? It's because there's, when I'm really meant to live, there's four o'clock. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right, and for instance, uh, the, uh, what the, uh, lots of these other uh, evolution of music people overlook is the idea that 99.9% .9 of the musical experience of human beings has been in group uh, dancing and singing. A whole lot of it still today is in group dancing and singing. But the idea that you go to a concert and hear specialists and sit there quietly in order to appreciate music, that's what happened. <laughs> that, that, that's an extremely interesting but very small, thin slice of what music is going to be to humans. So here's one of the earliest uh, cave paintings uh, of this sort of thing. So these guys go back and look uh, anthropologically. These guys here, and animals and music. And here's another one. Uh, so they, they have some uh, stuff that goes with that. And yeah, and if I knew how to read these things, we might all right, so then I've talked a little bit about this again. So they said, how is this dance then, if we have an evolutionary history to it, how is it onto genetically uh, put together? And here's the sort of dance of touches and looks and googly eyes and, uh, between uh, caregiver and infant. This is the herding book I've been talking a lot about. I highly recommend it. This is another book that got me onto this whole thing. Uh, William McNeil, Dance and Drill in Human History. Uh, all these things, I mean, the, the paper's on my website and all these references. Uh, but here's some really great stuff then uh, about um, their relationship to uh, group dancing. There's some really fun stuff about anthropology and history of religion, the way in which there's a sort of group dance, ecstatic relationship to the spiritual world. And that, how that slowly becomes specialized through the shaman into the priest and it becomes textual. Based. And then the, the backlash then, when you have now, we still have the group charismatic singing and dancing as part of religious practices. Which groups allow dancing and which don't? And there's a whole field that you can look into uh, with the relationship of the uh, priest, minister, rabbi, imam to the flock is, and how that's regulated in terms of who gets to dance and when they. When they so that's the whole thing with religion, and it crisscrosses with, uh, with military history. So that's a fun book. And the reason he starts off by saying, the IRS in 1941 in West Texas, and everybody knew that nobody, you don't march like that, maybe you march to get to battle like that, but you don't march on the battlefield, right? But then here we were drilling and drilling and drilling. And at first we said, what is this? It's crazy. And then we realized, uh, looking back at the end of basic training, this was the thing that we, that we liked the most. Then he said there's this sort of swelling uplifting of the group through this rhythmic entrainment that you get. Uh, now, he said there's always a dark side. I don't know if anybody recognizes him. That's Pinochet. He really did have a Darth Vader cape. <laughs> now look at it. Yeah, so the whole fascism, military marching, doing the whole thing, and the whole huge rhythmic stuff here. There's lots of stuff. So it's not, by any means, a guarantee of progress. I am working on some stuff about the human microphone now that the Occupy sites. Um, the city said, okay, well, we're not going to let you have electronic uh, uh, amplification. They said, okay, we'll use our bodies. We'll use it together. And I wonder if there isn't an affective kind of joy exactly from, from that. And then the next move I think is really fun too. Um, you know, I'm not out there. Kind of with those guys. But when they took the generators away in New York before the snowstorm, 
they uh, sort of hunkered down for a couple of days, but now they're doing bicycle generation. So it's an amazing substitution. And I wonder whether you don't, you were not going to get a sort of rhythmic uh, and uh, also overlay with sort of semantic stuff. But to do your duty, sacrifice your body, give your body the energy to the group. Right? There's going to be a whole very interesting stuff I think, about that, using the bicycle. Okay. So, uh, uh, McNeil also talks about work songs. So this is an ancient Greek uh, thing about the work songs. One of the a really great uh, things to see this would be at the end of uh, Seven Samurai. The very last scene of Seven, Seven Samurai, anybody remember? Tell, tell us. Wait, wait, what, what was that? The very last scene of Seven Samurai. Oh, I don't remember. The peasants are planting their rice in the paddy, right, with a rhythmic song. And the berserker, not quite berserker, but the samurai guys, who you know, fight individually, are watching that. And then you know, there's only three of them left, and they turn and they say, well, the real winners are the peasants. And because the, the, the bandits were themselves displaced the samurai. Bandits, which is, as at one point in there, one of the samurai says, well, they're just the samurai as well. So there's a lot of stuff to be read, despite being a great film, to be a lot of interesting things. So work songs, slave songs, the whole thing. All right, so the last to wrap up here, then to give this sort of, uh, military history thing, this is this guy, Drews, uh, talking about the end of the Bronze Age, which is the, the collapse of the Mycenaean palaces. So the uh, fall of Troy is part of this uh, collapse across the eastern Mediterranean uh, in this particular time period. And people have tried to figure out how that happened. So he inserts it into a, law, into a history, uh, military history here. So we have early infantry on the plains. That's why it's geo by the So they have early infantry. Uh, then they have these light chariots that take over, and this is sort of chronological. The collapse, he's going to clamor from hill runners uh, who are getting their friends using the war dance, and the way he reads the Iliad is that's what Hector, or this is what Achilles was. It's an individual whirlwind on the battlefield is faster than everybody, because what was his, uh, what was his nickname? Fleet-footed Achilles. His wily and long-suffering Odysseus, and what was Hector's name? Last line of the thing. And so the Trojans perform the funeral dances for funeral ceremonies for Hector, breaker of horses. So he reads them as the uh, uh, plains empires, because you know there's chariots in the Iliad, but you know, they've always noticed the Greeks didn't fight the chariots. So you know, that was a dark ages bard recalling this past time, and he doesn't really have any details of it. So they kind of or battle taxes, as they say. And they dismount and they do the trash talking. And, you know, my grandfather was Poseidon. And, you know, ah, my grandfather was Zeus. Ah. Was, okay, well then it's going to be the ocean versus the sky. Man. Let's get it on. Okay. And they have this kind of, well, that, that's because you have to get charged up to, to, to fight. And then you have to have the wine and the song afterwards to come down. That's how the whole thing starts with the stolen priesthood, the stolen daughters. Then we have the uh, horsemen, the sort of plains, high plains drifter kind of guys, the aristocrats. Uh, then we have the phalanx, and then we're going to have the brothers. All about rhythm, different modifications of desire, rhythm, passion, emotion, and the emotions. So there are some, I'm not obviously not an archaeologist, but I stole this off the web. But if I remember the site that I stole this off of, it has a evidence of this uh, sort of infantry fight. Then we have the ancient chariot warfare, right? Uh, and again, that's how uh, uh, a hill runner, this is actually a Gaelic warrior, but it's probably pretty close, right? And that's that's is up here. Achilles is a prototype of the hill runners, individual frenzy whirlwind on the battlefield who outflanks the horse guy. Uh, then uh, this is a 
somewhat respectful uh, proto-anthropological thing about the uh, New Zealanders, uh, the Maoris. Uh, you know, Jared, uh, I'm not, I'm, I, have to, I have to apologize for uttering uh, Jared Diamond's name in front of professional geographers. But if you remember in Guns, Germs, and Skills, he talks about the difference between, sort of political difference between New Zealand and I don't think anybody denies that, between the New Zealand uh, the relationship between Maoris and the treaties that they have and the uh, Australians. But anyway, this is that, and then this is its cultural uh, survival. Uh, and so insofar as rugby is like war, and the haka is like war dance, like that. And then this is a great picture. A, that there's a women's rugby world cup is great. B, that you have the New Zealanders doing their haka, and you can see there's uh, Maoris and Anglos uh, in, the, in the group. Uh, it's very interesting stuff here about the racial composition of the old black team. And you also have Fijians, too, right? so to, do, to see how New Zealand is put together. Right? Fascinating stuff there, but then what are the English women doing? They're touching each other, right? Because if they were standing alone, even if they were in a, a row standing alone, I, I guarantee their heart rate would have been much higher than having the physical touch of each other. And guaranteeing by their sharing their body that they're going to sacrifice themselves in the, on the battlefield for the team. And that touch and the lineup, uh, I think, is really, it's really, it's a great picture. Uh, but, so then there's the bit about the, uh, what Drews talks about in terms of being the Iliad. There's the whole, we could do the whole thing about the Amazons too, how they figure in there. There's uh, Penthesilea, I can never pronounce that name. Penthesilea. Then we have the phalanx, and you see the piper marching the two, uh, calling at the time. Right? This is a quote that's uh, from uh, Plutarch, and of course I got it uh, from uh, uh, other citations. It's not from my independent reading of Plutarch. <laughs> well, I've got to be sure to use this passage sometime. <laughs> <laughs> there is this sort of way in which, you know, fancy, uh, you know, I mean, we're talking at lunch. Foucault will do this. Well, of course, on volume seven of the 18 volume plan for a police. Uh, power, a, a, you know, from so-and-so von Marthen in, in Germany in 1742. <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> but anyway, this is a great uh, thing. Uh, it's quoted a lot in contemporary stuff, and this is about the Spartans. So I have not yet brought myself to, to watch 300. But do they have, like, a drummer in there? Do the Spartans go marching in? Okay, well, that's good. Well, the, and they, the whole, all of the battle scenes, like, even if you don't see them, there's like... Okay, cool. Well, that, that's really important. Because you don't want to individualize the phalanx. The whole thing is... Well, I'll like, oh, talk about it for a minute. Uh, <coughs> courage for the warrior is breaking the ranks and getting out in front and fighting one-on-one. -on -one, right? That's completely against the phalanxes. Thing. You'd be punished for that just as much for running away. So this idea that you know, there'd be like Spartan champions who would get up and do individual combat, as far as I know, it's not a really Spartan. Spartan. Uh, but who am I to, uh, to criticize Frank and Miller? <laughs> uh, all right, so here's the marathon, right? Uh, the heroes, uh, Sophocles is said, to, no, Aeschylus is said to have made sure that on his uh, uh, grave site, uh, was said that he fought at Marathon, not just that he won for the team the first prizes or whatever, right? But I fought at Marathon. Uh, and here's Salamis, uh, depiction of Salamis. And then we have the rowers, right? So there's another rhythmic thing, and these guys are the artisans, they're city rowers, they don't have land, right? But they come out rowing. And then here's Plato, we're going to wrap up with this. So he uh, talks, he's got this whole geo bio stuff about the land and the water, the ports, and the inland. We could do a whole thing as well with the Odyssey, right? What does uh, Odysseus is told by, I think, I'm not sure who tells him. Somebody tells him, take your oar up into the hills 
to the point at which somebody says, what are you doing with a winnowing, uh, winnowing span on your shoulder? At that point, you'll know that you can, uh, that you uh, are uh, at the place where you can meet the um, families of the suitors. And then he allows his father to kill one of the suitors, uh, and then he calls peace. His dad has to be rebuilt too. And at some other point, he says, no one could be happier than I am at this point. My father and my son, right, are trash talking each other and me as to who's going to be the bravest in this fight. Uh, so there's a whole, a whole Greek world sort of wrapped up in that one line. Um, so yeah, this whole uh, sea versus land thing. So he continues. Um, uh, you know, he's, he's ashamed that the Athenians would win at Salamis like that. To convert yourself from steady infantrymen into marines with their tricks. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I don't know the army and the air force, the army and the marines and the seals and the green berets uh, read this stuff and trash talk each other, but as far as I know, they do. So yes, so this was the uh, thing in Salamis, uh, the salvation. Uh, this is the rejoinder that the guy gives him, and then the last slide. He says, yeah, but at what price? It's almost we have to turn ourselves into, into rowers and marines. And it's actually, it's a little more complicated. The rowers were the artisans, the hoplites were still there, right? But they were sort of the marines that fought from the uh, decks of the ships. So they sort of do grappling hooks and invade. Uh, the thing that you had to do was tricky. It wasn't like, Okay, Persians, we're going to meet you at uh, Marathon uh, tomorrow. You have to be there. And then they march in. And actually, they, they march for a while, then they run. And they, they freaked out the Persians at Marathon. Uh, get these guys in really heavy armor for run a mile. And then start fighting. So there's the last line then. The bio, neuro, techno, geo stuff that I talk about, I think, is at least implicitly there in Plato. Our investigations in topography, he means that literally, land versus sea. And legislation, we focus on the moral worth of the social system. Uh, now, that's a particular translation. It's probably uh, it's probably Politeia, uh, which is the title for what we call the Republic. Politeia is something like basic constitution of a society. Okay, cool. That's uh, that's not quite an hour. Good enough. Thanks. So you, you touched on a few, yes, so the, the choice of the music. Uh, then there's the porn use. Uh, it's also the best investigations of uh, how much, when, where, what kind of porn is uh, used by uh, people uh, on the getting ready for that. Uh, obviously drugs and uh, alcohol before and after. 
there's lots of really complicated now uh, high tech uh, uh, pharmacological investigation for how do you get a, a speed that doesn't can keep you up for three days but not turn you into a kind of killer at the end of the three days. Uh, so what am I going to call go drugs? Did somebody say that? Uh, anyway, there's a there's a book by somebody named Morena uh, called Mind Wars. Uh, I think something like that. And it, it's into because it goes into the neuro experimentations, because there's all sorts of things. How fast can you process information? How many uh, um, uh, for pilots, how many dials can we actually get onto a dashboard before they look at it? Well yeah, I mean they can't you, information overload, they have to be very careful about how how you can train up your visual processing. Uh, so yeah, commercial pilots, a whole bunch of stuff with regard to that. So yeah, there would be a whole field, and music would certainly play a big role, and headbanger and uh, music, and of course then that famously bleeds into the use of music torture in uh, one So that's part of, part of the... Uh, torture is, has two sort of models. One is you produce a threat to life so that it's a sort of panicked animal reaction, so in order to save your, your, your life, your life for the, the victim, then they will blurt out the stuff, anything that keep it from, so they try to produce a life threatening The other way is to destabilize their personality. You can do that through stress positions, all this sort of non, non lethal stuff. So the um, Gonzalez's memo uh, that said that you can't, you can't do that sort of life threatening or what would be life threatening pain reduction. Uh, but you can't do anything short of that. So uh, music is one of the ways. Sleep deprivation, strobe lights, uh, forced watching of gay porn apparently was reported as part of the destabilizing stuff at, uh, at one time level. Um, I, I haven't been able to figure out what whether they included food or what kind of how they did the food. It's, uh, it is not you're not supposed to be able to feed people to like violation of some uh, international law, uh, like bland, tasteless mush, even if it is nutritious. So that, actually, that's considered a mistreatment. Uh, but I wonder whether they don't experiment. I, I know you can't feed them bad food. You can't feed them spoiled or rotten. And I don't think that you're able to feed them tasteless mush. And of course, then that whole other thing is put over against the sort of psychological uh, thing where you befriend people. And so there's advocates of the other side say, well, you get much better results. This is the famous World War II interrogators of the Germans. So, oh, we, we got lots of information from the Germans. We didn't do any of that stuff, right? First of all, we knew German because lots of our German families here in the United States, Jewish populations, German speakers still in the 40s. And, um, uh, we befriended them and sort of showed them that they were real human beings. And uh, you know, after a while, it took some time, but uh, we got lots of information out. So they were, they were sort of uh, complaining uh, about what the noble uh, uh, mission of Army intelligence gathering that they had performed in, in uh, World War II without any resort to any of this stuff uh, has been was demeaned by the Army. The water water would be more towards the first one, inducing a life threatening panic. Uh, but then the whole stress deprivation of the sleep. So either side of it, you know, building, tearing somebody down or building somebody up. So yes, uh, any of those kind of things would have to be fit into, into the equation. So you mentioned the music right there, but the factor. Um, I'm, I was interested in what you were first saying about like work songs. Um, mm -hmm. And thinking about especially kind of slave songs mm -hmm. and the blues in particular, yeah. um, like how how might we think about the kind of emergence of uh, improvisation and the kind of creation of the blues as a kind of reaction to the like kind of phalanx formation of like working on a plantation oh, or okay. a, in a chain gang or mm -hmm. something like that, mm -hmm. kind of breaking out from a 
you know, kind of unitary narrative, but more individualistic one. Well, but then, but then there's always a conversation between the, the soloist and the other people. And the thing. I, mean, I, I don't really know much about music uh, criticism, but that sounds like a perfectly reasonable hypothesis. Uh, I know there's lots of people who study that sort of evolution uh, of our native art form, uh, you know, blues and jazz, uh, and tracing those, rea those the relation to the spirituals. The whole introduction of uh, Christianity into uh, this sort of relationship between masters and slaves, as far as I know, is, is, is at least according to um, uh, what's his name, Ira Berlin, I think is his name, Generations of Captivity, uh, is a kind of 19th century thing. Prior to that, you, you, you know, lots of planters didn't want to teach their slaves Christianity. Did their own thing back in the sort of slave quarters, whatever it was, we didn't really care about it. Uh, but uh, so the, the, the introduction of Christianity and the, the spiritual as part you know, in that range of African American music uh, is, is would have to be part of this larger picture of uh, how and when uh, people can uh, sort of manage the all men are brothers aspect of the Christian message and the um, uh, render under Caesar uh, aspect of uh, the Christian message and how all those things. And then the role of obviously the Christians in the abolitionist movement. I mean, once you get into the whole field. What I like about this, let me, let me put this on. What I like about these case studies, the Roman philosophy, and you know, sort of like starting with this specific, uh, specific kinds of cases. Uh, it's, it's you know hugely interdisciplinary uh, because uh, everything is everything is connected, right? Uh, but they're connected in more or less clear ways. And as you focus in on this, there's a sort of range of things which are clearly connected to it, and then there's more sort of uh, vaguely connected things. And that's what Deleuze calls the zone of indiscernibility that connects uh, ideas to. But yeah, you can follow all sorts of choices. I mean, we're going to end up talking about quantum mechanics soon enough. If you're coming. Uh, so yeah, I think he's a holist in that kind of ontological sense. Uh, so so Leibniz, Spinoza, uh, uh, Leibniz, uh, Whitehead, Engel, uh, Joe, uh, Joe follows the people who follow this kind of thing. Steve Shivago versus Graham Harmon kind of thing. But yeah, I, I, I think that once you get into that, you can see the way in which uh, you can work, let's put this way, you work backwards in a case study from an intensive process to see the virtual field of which it is a resolution. So that's why you can take the hurricane, right? and you can sort of work backwards to see, well, it's composed of wind and water currents, particularly thresholds, traveling off the coast of Africa because that's where they will form, various times of the year, because it transmits uh, solar energy basically around the globe. This, that, and the other thing, um, it's just with hum humans, it's much more complicated than that. <laughs> but that's the basic idea. You start here, and you can move up to see these connections. I've got a question just going back to when you were just laying the groundwork of what you were going through. Um, you, you mentioned, uh, or you, you described affect according to non-subjectivity, um, saying that uh, affect um, is not possessed by the subject, but it's what takes over a subject. In strong basic emotion cases. Okay. And so then, um, and then you may have been just kind of trying to make it super basic so that you can move on. So I'm just curious about that. Does it does that? presuppose subjectivity as only related to cognition or only related to the conscious self? Or Yes, okay, good. Uh, I, I adhere, I guess, my credo uh, is, at least for this up to now, I have some questions about it, but it's a movement in cognitive science called uh, 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 the uh, mind in life uh, position, mind in life continuity. And it's laid out by Evan Thompson in a book from 2007 called Mind and Life. Um, 
and the idea being that from single cell organisms, right, uh, have sense-making capacities. So they've done all this stuff with E. coli, and they'll follow sugar, and they'll run away from vinegar. And so you've got the uh, single cell organism has to have a threefold sense making capacity. It has to be open to uh, the has to have sensibility, that is, openness to its environment. It has to then be able to have a value on changes in, in its environment relative to the uh, values of its own that it sets up from its own. Uh, so, in other words, it has to be able to track the increasing gradient of the sugar and to know that sugar is good for it. And then the last part is that we've lost this notion of the sense in English, but making sense, sensibility and the making sense of something. But we lost this in English, but it's still present in German and French and Italian. It's the directional notion of the sense. So there's an old, old notion uh, in English of the sense of a river. That's the direction of in French, the sens unique is a uh, one notion. Zin in German has directional components to it, and senso unico in Italian, I think in Spanish too, but, but anyway, so that, those are the three four things. But, right, certainly not, so you might have to say that they're, cognizant, they're cognizant, somehow, they're sentient, somehow, and they have affective and cognitive capacity. And over evolutionary time, we get us. But it's a continuity. But among the qualitative changes and the qualitative improvements, maybe not improvements, qualitative changes, would be varying levels of consciousness and the following self consciousness, language, autobiographical narratives, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So those could never be, you know, push them all the way down. The idea is can you push the potentials or the roots of those things? Uh, evolutionary from the single cell organisms. And that's the, you know, lots of bitter fights are fought over that. But that's Thompson's position coming out of Francisco Barrera. Uh, but I kind of, I didn't criticize it, but I posed the question in an essay, review essay of his book, in Journal of Consciousness Studies, in which I said, well, why do you stop at the single cell organism? Why don't you go down like the cyberneticists do to any sort of self-organism material system? Uh, in fact, why do you even stop there? Why don't you go whole hog and be a panpsychist? Which is like, uh, uh, which you might associate with like, like a crazy continental philosophy position, but a really nice, hardcore, rigorous, precise uh, analytic philosopher named Galen Schlosser is a panpsychist. So you can approach it from other side. But yeah. So yeah, so that's that's a that's perfectly it's a perfect question. So of no the single cell organism. Uh, so what is it that I you sometimes use this kind of notion that we are desubjectified in the sense that the subject as um, autobiographical, linguistic, conscious and self-conscious self engaged in complex social interactions. That's the decent job. Kind of blind rage. So Tableite uh, sometimes will uh, mention these kind of things where the, and it's actually now in, enshrined in the homophobic rage uh, uh, defense in uh, criminal justice. I panicked, I blacked out, I didn't know. And the next thing I remember, I woke up and there was blood all over me. It must have been me, but uh, there was no mens rea. That's the thing. You have to be, know what you're doing. So the, the defense is that it was a blind rage. Uh, and that's what I mean by decent. Same thing with it. Panic is a little more interesting. You can have a sort of blind runaway panic. And then you can have a frozen in spot in place panic in which you're conscious, you just can't move your arms and legs. If you've ever had that experience, right? you're so petrified that you can't move. But you're there. You're observing yourself not being able to move. Sometimes you, I get, sometimes you get nightmares about that. But you're frozen. In bed, in the tiger or vampire or whatever it is, whatever you're right. You're calling for Buffy, and this vampire is coming after you, and you're frozen. Uh, 
Uh, so there's lots of evolutionary stuff about that. So uh, panic is a more interesting uh, thing. But anger is the, that's the case. There's no first person, there's no responsibility, there's no thing. And you have to like infer from the results of the case. And there are testimonies about that. I woke up and I had blood on. So if I can just ask a brief follow-up, then then that that is kind of this this approach then is uh, positing a subject that is cognition of knowing oneself doing something. Be yeah, that's, that's a capacity of human beings that has developed okay. over time, uh, both evolutionarily and ontogenetically. Babies don't pop up like that. You have to teach them. The whole Nietzsche thing, you have to learn to teach them how to be responsible, how they say I, for, you know, I do this, I do that, how do you connect up? So there's a sort of psycho-onto, as you know, I work on it. Yeah. Thanks for uh, Kant's uh, transcendental uh, ego. Possibility of adding the I think to any sort of judgment. Well, that's an adult, uh, uh, adult male, uh, an adult uh, model, right? Well, that has to develop. You have to teach kids. Now, most culture, all cultures, for example, uh, have uh, uh, subjectivation practices that get human beings to that level. Most human beings, obviously. But yeah. You learn their language, you can talk to anybody. That's the thing. You have to live with them long enough to learn their language. Everybody can tell stories. In fact, there are lots of anthropologists that test that. You know, hunter gatherer societies, which are foragers, which is kind of more unusual term than primitive people, they're way smarter than we are with regard to hundreds of different things. They're but much more, we know lots of language facts and stuff like that, but yeah, they're all the famous stories. You know, they have 42 different names for the plants in, in their thing, right? You can tell they have amazing uh, capacities. And then the sort of uh, uh, kinship systems. 14 names for uncle. Because <laughs> there's 14 different types of uncles. Okay? So yeah, I mean, uh, that, that, uh, that uh, all human cultures have subjectivation practices that take little babies from where they are to to have that sort of you know, rational, subjective, humanistic uh, capacities. Yeah. I'm interested in, in kind of the relationship between, you know, you've identified five sort of basic desubjectifying. Well, I don't know if all of them are desubjectifying, but at least the rage is the one that I really focus on because it has the military applications. But most people do talk about five basic emotions. I mean, you would think that that's where you get the analytical specificity, mm -hmm. maybe, of these things. And I think they sort of are. I mean, I was, I was remembering I went to an amusement park mm -hmm. the other day, right, mm -hmm. for the first time in a long time. You know, you're really scared, and you get on the top of this roller coaster, and you, right. like, right. you do lose yourself yes. a little bit, yeah. and sort of, like, yes. giggling or yes. what have you, you know? Yes. It's, always a, it's the same thing with, with, obviously, fear and anger, where you, yes. you feel as though yes. your self-control is lost. But then, these things have a kind of translation into yes. a very subjectifying kind of emotion, which would be like joy to happiness, for example. Yes. Yes. So I'm wondering how you think. Well, were you with other people uh, when you went to the amusement park? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't. So fun because you get in, you have to get into the uh, roller coaster car with all your buddies. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot, there's a kind of group share uh, thing like that, and uh, you know, giggling and screaming builds on each other. Um, yeah, there's a couple of things I would say about that. One is, you know, looking for th thrill seeking. Right? So vertigo, uh, lots of sports, is, you, know, you do all that training in order to get on the edge so that when you're at a point where you look back and you've made a bond that day. Or, you know, break through the, the line and you're, you're running and doing this kind of Reggie Bush thing. <laughs> Um, uh, or whatever, the haka, or the, uh, the you know, running. So there's a lot of thrill seeking behavior. So you can look back at what it is about our stress systems. So one of the ways that we look evolutionarily back uh, is that our, we have all this adrenaline, norepinephrine, uh, uh, endorphins, and you know, there's a whole big analgesic thing when you're really pumped up. Or you can run on a broken ankle, or you can lift the 
Volkswagen off of your baby, you know, it's all, even though you're tearing, you just tore all the muscles in your shoulder, right? You know, those are real things, right? They're, they're not, they're not just urban legends. Right? Um, but we've evolved for that for sort of big, intense things that happen every once in a while. You know, when the lion comes after you, you better be able to run really fast, even though he took a chunk out of your ankle. Uh, but what we have is a sort of every day, oh my God, am I going to lose my health insurance? And, you know, how can I face uh, my kids? I mean, I'm putting them at risk, and, like, uh, and that's sort of every day sort of thing. So there's sort of you know, daily uh, physiolo psychophysiological drain of the workplace. Right? Exhaust us, or adrenals, or cortisol, right? And there's a whole bunch of ways that you can probably connect that, so, uh, chronic fatigue. There's a guy named uh, Randy Martin who has a book called The Financialization of Everyday Life. And here he's talking about sort of risk-taking behavior with regard to handling your own investments. And there's also a machismo in the TV commercials about that. Like, Take charge of your investments. <laughs> you're a like, girly man or something. You're not even, you don't have to own your own investments. But you have a mutual fund. 